at Manchester United. Roy Keane was the big leader <laughs> in that dressing room. And obviously, yeah. we all looked up to him. Uh, we, we all know Roy, no? but when you are 17, I mean, it was kind of scary at some point. <laughs> no, I, I really, I, I remember a few years later when I was playing for Barcelona, he came to me yeah. to talk and part of me was like that little kid when I arrived at Manchester when I was 17, like, a Roy Keane studio. <laughs> so, he's like, come on, Gerard. <laughs> you are already you 24. Manchester's obviously influenced your dress. You've got Liam Gallagher's jacket <laughs> on, you've got Stone Island pants. <laughs> a little bit. What was the last conversation with Sir Alex and the boss? I have this offer from Barcelona, which is the club of my life. I'm just asking you to let me go. Were you nervous going into that meeting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a tough one. It was a tough meeting. <laughs> Guardiola Mourinho was here in Spain, it was very tough. And Guardiola left because at some point it, it was too much. Would you ever go into coaching? No, no chance. I saw you <laughs> and I learned from you, no chance. <laughs> On this episode of The Overlap, I travelled to Barcelona to catch up with my former teammate and one of the best defenders of his generation. Gerard Piquet has won 25 major trophies for club and country. We talk about La Masia, Manchester United and Barcelona, as well as his many business interests outside of the game. Gerard, welcome to the Overlap and we're back where it began at La Masia. So Thank talk you. to us a little bit about how special this place is and what it means to young players from Barcelona. I mean, it's very special. I've been part of La Masia for 10 years before I joined Manchester United. And I eat there, I train every day, and I didn't sleep, but I, I had a lot of experience with players and, and with teammates like Sas Fabregas, like Leo Messi, like all this generation that uh, we started in the club in 98, I think, 99, when we were 10 years old. And that most of us succeeded as a professional players, which means that that generation worked it out. It, it was a good one. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> Just in terms of the Barcelona principles, you grew up as a Barcelona fan. What are your early memories of Barcelona and your thoughts and how you became attracted to them as a club? My first memory is when we won the Champions League. At that time, it was the European Cup in 92 in Wembley. I was five years old. And then I start remembering when I was going to the Camp Nou every two weeks to watch Barcelona play at home with my parents. Uh, we had seats there and, and for me, I mean, it has been always a dream no, to, to be part of this club. When I remember starting going to the Camp Nou. How important do you think it is a, in terms of a football club like Barcelona to produce young players and have the spirit of the club sort of from the beginning? For, for Barcelona, I think it's key. It's been proven in the history of this club that when the coach uh, trusts in, in the young players, Barcelona is working well. When this doesn't happen, that it happens sometimes in the history, normally we don't get trophies. So for Barcelona special to have La Masia and to invest in young players, it's very, very important. I'm going to throw it forward. You're in Barcelona, you've grown up here all your life, your grandfather's been the vice president, you're a season ticket holder. Why the hell did you go to Manchester? <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. It's an interesting question. Uh, well, uh, I was 17 years old. Uh, at that time, it was one of those moments where, for whatever reason, the club didn't trust a lot in La Masia and the young players. Who was that? The, the, the president or was it the manager? Uh, normally, it's not just one guy. Normally, it's the whole organization that, for whatever reason, their strategy wasn't that one. I remember Andres Iniesta, that uh, he was three years older than me. He was 20 at the time, or Xavi, he was a little bit older, that they were very, very good. And they've been, I mean, they've proved in their careers that they were amazing. And at that time, they, they were not playing in the first team. They were starting to train with them, playing a little bit, some games, but they, they didn't trust no, in, in those players. And I realized that maybe it was time to, to go. I remember that Manchester United was offering good money and, and the chance to start training with the first team. And I went to Barcelona and I asked, I think it was one third of what Manchester United was offering me. And they said no. And then is when I realized that Maybe they were not being confident or, or trusting in me, so I decided to leave. Is that when a club loses sight of its principles, its values, and it makes decisions like that? Yeah, yeah, I'm totally sure about that. I mean, as I said, historically, Barcelona 
has always been a successful club when they are confident in their youth, uh, in their academy, in La Masia, and when they trust in that. And Pep Guardiola's moment in 2008-2009, we had 10-11 players from La Masia. I mean, you can see that, no? And in a club like Football Club Barcelona, it's, it's very important. What did your family say to you around that time when you were making this decision? Did you make it on your own or with your representatives or with your family? Because your family is so embedded in Barcelona. At that time, when you are 17, you make decisions, obviously talking to your family, to, to everyone really. And I remember my mom suffering a lot at that time because obviously... You're leaving. Your, your kid leaving at 17, <laughs> I mean, it was tough. But uh, I think it helped me a lot in, in building my career because at the end of the day when you are 17 and, and you have to leave tough moments, if you leave it alone and you are hard enough or strong enough to keep going, I think then it's, it's much more easy. Manchester's obviously influenced your dress. You've got Liam Gallagher's jacket <laughs> on, you've got Stone Island pants. <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. Tell me about that first impression when you met Sir Alex Ferguson and what did he say to you that encouraged you to come to Old Trafford and to Manchester? He was like a second dad. I always said that uh, he gave you that sense of trust, of being close to you, everything you need. He was there. It wasn't just a coach. And I think that since the beginning when I met him the first time, uh, I realised that I had to do that movement. He convinced me. And tell us about your first experience in that first year living. You lived in Sale, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barcelona, <laughs> Sale. How did that go? It was a big change, eh? <laughs> At Manchester United. Was there an incident with your phone? Where your phone... <laughs> <laughs> that was right <Rocky. laughs> The guy stand up. Who the f*** is this phone? <laughs> me like... <laughs> OK, it's me. Oh. Thoughts was about leaving Barcelona and ending up in Manchester. <laughs> that was a big change. And I realised that when I arrived in Sale, I was <laughs> starting to live with an English family. They were very helpful to me, but the food wasn't the same, the weather wasn't the same. <laughs> My English wasn't perfect at all. So a lot of changes in a period of time that when you are 17 and that I was living here, I would say, in a bubble with my family, very protected in Barcelona. I knew everyone, I have friends, I have all my family, and all of a sudden you realize you are in Manchester living alone in Sale with an English family. And no one with stuff. you at all? You went on your no, own? No, no one. I decided to go alone. I mean, my, my parents were working here and I didn't want them to take a decision of stopping or leaving their work and, and coming with me. And I, I wanted to leave that experience alone. What were your first impressions on the football side when you went into the training ground and how it was compared to what you'd experienced here? Very different. I mean, uh, I remember in Barcelona, I was in the under 19. We, we had just one pitch to train. Uh, I arrived at, uh, uh, in Manchester, in Carrington. I remember training ground, we have so many pitches and then grass perfectly cut. I don't know if you remember, but one of my first days that I arrived in the dressing room, you played uh, a game where you had to say who was the best player of, of the team and the worst player of the team. You don't remember that. It, it was one of the tough... Was tough I, <laughs> I think I... It was the old dressing room of, of Carrington and you had to stand up in the table and you asked questions and you were one of the, you know, you were the captain. Oh, it was your initiation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Initiation. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the questions was, you have to say that the who consider you the, the best player on the team and the worst player of the team. Oh, that's that brutal. Was, that, was, that was horrible. That, <laughs> I don't remember who I said, I, I really, I don't remember. But it was a tough one. But yeah, I mean, it's part of the, you know, initiation, as you say. <laughs> we were toughening you up, weren't you? Obviously, yeah, yeah, exactly, was... exactly, exactly. I arrived there and I was a kid and these kind of things, at that time you suffer a lot, but then, I mean, it makes you stronger. You talked about the food. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything you liked? What was the difference? I was a slim when I arrived, but I mean... <laughs> you, you after one month, yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was, I mean, I remember first day with Linda and Tony, they were uh, the family that they, they take care of me when, when I arrived. And the first day they serve um, a cake with lemon. It was like hot lemon that uh, <laughs> I didn't like lemon. I didn't like the cake. I didn't like anything. I was nearly to throw up the first day. So it was horrible. And then I realized, listen, I mean, 
make your mind here, you will yeah. have to change a lot of things if you want to succeed. <laughs> Did you feel like giving up at any point in those early months? Did you feel like saying, oh, I'm not, just going to go back, I made a mistake? Not giving up, but at times where you are at home, uh, you left everything to, to, to have the dream of playing for the first team of Manchester United and feeling that I was not there yet, that obviously in the first team you, you had Rio Ferdinand, you had Bidic, at that time they were the best two centre-backs in the world, realising that it will be tough to get minutes, etc. So, uh, no, not easy, not easy. But uh, as I say, uh, it was a great time to learn, a great time to be strong. And, and then when I came back to Barcelona at the age of 21, uh, made me realize how fortunate I was to coming back to Barcelona playing for the first team and, and that period of time helped me a lot to realize all of that. Just let me ask you a little bit about obviously Roy Keane was the big leader <laughs> yeah. in that dressing room and your impressions of Roy and obviously yeah. we all looked up to him but how are you sort of your personal experience was with him? Roy was I mean we all know Roy no but when you are 17 I mean for sure you look Roy differently that how I looked at that time, because I, I just arrived, I didn't know him, and you know, I, it was kind of scary at some point. <laughs> I remember, imagine how scary it was that a few years later, when I was playing for Barcelona, we went to play uh, against Celtic in yes, Scotland, yeah. and he was doing some kind of TV program or something, that he was uh, Sky, or yeah. I, I don't remember, and I was walking after the game and he came to me yeah. to talk, and part of me was like, that little kid when I arrived at Manchester when I was 17, like, <laughs> Roy Keane's <to> here. <laughs> so, he's like, come on, Gerard, <laughs> you are already 24, 25, come on, man. <laughs> so I, I, I say hi and we talked and it was fine. But I remember at that time when I was 17 that Roy was kind of, you know, uh, he was the captain, he, you know, strong voice, uh, always uh, tough message. It was, I think it was a great captain, but it was tough sometimes. So was there an incident with your phone? Where your phone... <laughs> <laughs> that was Roy Keane. <laughs> and now, sometimes, I see, I mean, my teammates and, and me, using the phone before the game, after the game, and you tell, time. And you tell them to get off it? No, 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 no. no. I mean, now, <laughs> now things have changed a lot. But at that time, it just, it was vibrating. <laughs> And the guy feel it in his head because there was the pants in the dressing room. You know, the, the Old Trafford dressing room is very small. And, and the guy stand up, who the f is falling? <laughs> He's like, oh, okay, it's me. Oh, and he just snapped me. Good uh, discipline though, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but now it's very different. The old ones or the veterans uh, uh, with the young ones, it's totally different, yeah. the relationship. At that time there was, much more respect, but because obviously yeah. the old ones, they, they wanted that and they want that distance. Now the youngs arrive and after six months, they are like best teammates. <laughs> and so it's a different mentality, which they are different, not better yeah. or worse, it, it's a different time. You know, did it feel like it strengthened you a lot? Yeah, a lot, a lot. In all senses, eh? physically, mentally, I got a lot of experience. So it helped me a lot, it's true that I really wanted to play more in that period because, yeah. uh, but as I said, I mean, there were two of the best centre-backs in the world. Last year that I was at Manchester United, we were lucky to win the Premier League and the Champions League in, in Moscow, in Russia. And I mean, they were there, they were playing incredibly well. So yeah. it was tough to break through, even though I, I think that I was ready. But at that time, yeah. I learned a lot no matter what. My memory of you, obviously, other than the football side, was some mornings you would come in in the last year, <laughs> You were in for the good time in Manchester, weren't you? You and the boys, it was Cristiano, you, Anderson, yeah. Nani. You were having a good time there, weren't you? Yeah, we were young. I, 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 I always say to the young ones that they have to enjoy life. I mean, football is true that you have to focus 100%, but there are some times in the season where you need to disconnect, because if not, you will get injured or yeah. you will get stressed out and, and you will not have the performance you need. You have to focus 100% on the game and playing very good and, and helping the team. But there are moments where you have, I don't know, one week off because international break or yeah. you don't have a game mid midweek. You have two days off, enjoy, go out, uh, you are young. Because if not, at the end of the day, if you don't do that and you just focus in football, I think it's, it's not good. I remember when I arrived here, I was 21 and Puyol was 30 at the time. He was the captain here and he never went out before. 
And I arrived there, we started to be like very good mates. And I said, come on, come with me, have a drink. And the guy came, oh, sure, I need to do this more. So <laughs> I started to bring Puyol to, to have some drinks. After three days or four days in Barcelona, everyone started to say, oh, Puyol is going out, he's going out. Oh. And the guy said, I'm not going out anymore. Because, you know, the hair of Puyol, it was very difficult. I mean, in, in any nightclub, I mean, you can see. And I was, it was my first year here and no one recognizes me yet because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was starting, so... so I enjoyed... a bad influence on Puyol? No, I don't think so. I think <laughs> I was a good influence. He was a good influence on me. Just we share different points of view, and at the end of the day, I think that part of me is good for him and part of him is good for me. So uh, I think that we complement each other very well. Talk to me about sort of the end at Manchester United, and we all remember that game at Bolton. Yeah. Do you still remember that game well? Do you still think about it in terms of how it sort of? You yeah. know, do you still think about that? Because now you're brilliant in the air. You yeah. Know, yeah, you, it's something that you learn in. It's a process, and, and you learn it from experience like that one. You go there in Bolton, you play as a starter, a difficult pitch, difficult situation, and you lose one zero, and because of that action. And when I see it now, go I go back and I see I see that moment. At that moment, I, I felt very bad, and and then um, I mean, Alex Ferguson kind of lost uh, the confidence and the trust in me. But if I wouldn't do that, maybe I would not join Barcelona and I, yeah. I, I didn't leave everything that I, I, I've lived with Barcelona. So it's part of life, it's something that happened. And I think that because of that, I left that summer to Barcelona and, and I was, uh, I had the opportunity to win the travel here the first year I arrived, then all the titles that we won. So things happen for a reason and I think that that game happened for the reason of Sir Alex Ferguson, as they say, uh, not trusting to me more and me leaving to Barcelona and everything that happened yeah. after that. What was the last conversation with Sir Alex and the boss? Yeah, I went to the office and I said, listen, Sir Alex, I'm not playing as I wanted to. I have this offer from Barcelona, which is the club of my life, uh, as you know, and I'm just asking you to let me go for a low price. I remember it was 5 million euros. And you asked him that? Yeah. yeah because <laughs> hey, that's a big thing to do, though, eh? It was a tough one. It was a tough meeting. <laughs> because for me, I mean, asking to leave, and obviously it was like asking a favor, because uh, Sir Alex could say, OK, you can leave, but you have to pay, I don't know, 15 or 20 million. And yeah. for that number, the operation yeah. would never have made it, no? So, so Alex had these kind of things that I appreciate a lot, which is that he was very close to you and, and he understood your issues or your problems. And, and yeah, at the end of the day, it worked it out. I went to Barcelona and, and we, we succeed a lot here. In terms of Pep Guardiola, what's the one thing you take from the time that you spent with him? He touched your heart. Guardiola Mourinho was here in Spain. It was very tough. And I remember that at the end of the day, Guardiola left because at some point it was too much. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick thank you to Skybet, our partners, for making this show happen. It's something I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Please subscribe, there's loads more episodes coming up and I hope you're enjoying it. Right, let's get back into this episode. So, this young Spanish centre-back gets bullied at Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> he leaves to Barcelona. I mean, when every player leaves in the dressing room, you move on. We don't think and imagine that 12 months later, that same centre-back <laughs> is going to be playing in a European Cup final, Champions League final. Yeah. And I'm in the stand, I'm injured, <laughs> and I'm watching you split level with Valdez and Yaya Torre, and, I'm, and the ball's getting past you on the touchline. And I'm thinking, what the f is going on? We're going to kill these. <laughs> what yeah. the hell happened? How has that happened? And it, was that the, the, the I suppose the, the, the Guardiola era and the philosophy was born that day, it felt like to me. It felt like the whole world watched. Yeah, I think the context always helped. Also, the, the trust that the coach gives to you helps. Um, if the philosophy is the one that you've been learning from since you are very young also help. I think it was um, a combination of a lot of things that when I arrived here, new coach, Barcelona was, wasn't doing well. I remember Ronaldinho left at the time, Deco left, Eto'o was nearly to leave at the end, he didn't leave. 
So I arrived, Sergio Busquets was coming from the La Masia, Pedro was coming from La Masia, Iniesta, Xavi, Messi, Guardiola gave them a lot of confidence and, and trust on them. And the team all of a sudden started to grow, grow, grow. We started not very good the first month of the competition, but then all of a sudden we started to win everything and we won the treble. I mean, winning in Rome against you in the final, so, and playing a very good football. In just 12 months, a career can change a lot and, and a club also can change a lot because, as I said, Barcelona, the season before was very poor. I, I'd never seen centre-backs, though, split so deep. Yeah. Had you been doing that since La Masia? We do this in La Masia. It's part of the philosophy that Johan Cruyff brought to the club, I mean, in the 90s. To do it in the first team as a professional is much more difficult and it depends on the coach. The coach has to trust a lot the centre-backs and has to trust a lot the whole philosophy of we start playing from the back, from the keeper and we don't lose the ball, we don't throw the ball long, we start and we do short passes and from there we build the play. No? And every time you do it, it's better and better and better. All of a sudden we felt that it was quite easy to do something that it seems very difficult from outside if you don't train every day, you know. In, in terms of that final, in that first 10 minutes, did you feel a little bit nervous that yeah. Manchester United were getting yeah. chances, that you felt like the tactic was going to get found out? Or did Pep Guardiola just say, I don't care whatever happens, you just carry on doing that? We won the league and the cup already, and if we win that game, we won the Champions League. never happened in the history of this club and yeah. in the history of Spanish uh, clubs that a team wins the treble. Somehow we, we were kind of nervous. I remember in the dressing room before starting the game, Pep Guardiola put us a video of ourselves with the families, etc. Uh, remembering the whole year, what we did to arrive to that point, etc. And I think that that video didn't help at, at all <laughs> <laughs> because we arrived like it was emotional. And, and before a game like this, I, I think that watching a video <laughs> of that characteristic, it didn't help. So we arrived into the pitch and the first five, ten minutes, I remember there was a free kick of Cristiano Ronaldo that Jason Park was nearly to score a goal. You, you had two or three yeah. good chances and we suffered. But then the goal of Samuel Eto'o, I think, in the yeah. minute 15, uh, it helped a lot us to, to be calm and, and to start playing our game. In terms of Pep Guardiola, what's the one thing you take from the time that you spent with him? He's very clever and, and he understands the game as no one I've seen before. He gives you all the tools to go to the game and be ready and for any kind of situation. He studies very well the other team and from that he starts to tell you you have to do this in this situation, in that situation. So you feel very confident that you will be ready for the game no matter the challenge, no matter how difficult it will be the striker you have to mark or the centre-back you will have to face. And this is all because of him. He knows how to prepare the games, mentally he's very good, his speeches are very emotional, so it What's makes that, you what, feel... What kind of emotional things before the games? No, related, uh, he touched your heart, related to, I don't know, depending on the game, if there is, I don't know, I remember that time Barcelona versus Madrid, there, there were a, a, different episodes where the rivality is very, yeah. very big with Mourinho, when Mourinho was the coach of Madrid. And I remember that talking, he used the right word every time uh, to make you feel that, that you have in front of you a very strong challenge, but an opportunity to prove yourself and to prove to the world that we are here and that we can beat them. And at that time, every, as I say, every time we, we had to face Real Madrid was a, a tough one. What was the rivalry like between him and Jose Mourinho? Because you feel that in the dressing room. It was like, obviously, to Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger. You could feel yeah. it when the game was coming. No, no. Uh, Guardiola <laughs> Mourinho was here in Spain. It was very tough. I remember Mourinho arrived to Madrid, winning the treble with Inter Milan. Yeah. And he was like the guy that will save Madrid and that will make uh, the team win against us because we were winning everything at the time. And I remember that the first time Mourinho came to Camp Nou, he lost 5-0 against us in Barcelona. And it was a shock of reality of, whoa, uh, these guys are, are going hard. But it's true that Mourinho in the, the, in the press conference every time, he was every day, you know, you know how he is, his style. And, and I think that Guardiola, um, at some point, it, it was too much. I mean, it was more important sometimes what happened out of the pitch than what, what was happening on the pitch, no? And, and I remember that at the end of the day, Guardiola left 
because at some point, I mean, Mourinho, that time Madrid won the league that year and all of a sudden he decided to leave for so many reasons, but I'm sure that part of it is, it was because with Mourinho, it was too much. I mean, every day in the press, like I don't think so. I remember semi-final of the Champions League in Bernabeu, he did um, an amazing press conference, but it wasn't about football and he enjoys uh, talking about what's happening on the pitch. And here there was a moment where the press was focusing on what was happening outside of the beach. So you think it almost in some ways destroyed his feeling for football and how he, how he sees football? At that time, for sure. Since he arrived, he tried to do that. He knew that on the pitch they were weaker than us. We, we had a better team, for sure. Even the relationship between players. I remember when we were going to a national team after those games yeah. and, and it was tough because Mourinho sometimes... He creates that. Yeah, he goes to the <laughs> mind of the player and he tells you, oh, this guy hates you, then you believe that he hates you, you know? And then he goes to the, to the dressing room. We were in the dressing room of the national team and me, I was going to Iker Casillas, hey, Iker! And the guy didn't talk to me, well, what's happening? And it's because at that time I didn't know, but then I realized that it was because the coach really know how to go to their minds and, and change the, the, the whole... Yeah. What, what what he was thinking about. But you were successful with Spain at the time. You were winning championships. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's true. And the Euro 2012, uh, we wanted in the worst moment of the rivality between Barcelona and Madrid. Yeah. But we really need to do an exercise between Barcelona players and Madrid players to sit down and say, listen, we have to play together. So you we sat, have you to sat win. down together? At some point we did that, yeah. I remember Xavi, Xavi and Iker from Barcelona and from Madrid. They were very close friends, but even them, that they were very close friends, at some point they stopped talking because of that rivality. <laughs> which it seems stupid right now, but it happened. I remember that they sit down and they started to create another, I mean, links again and on trying to, to become a good dressing room, at least to win the title. And we won it, so yeah, uh, but it was difficult times at, at that moment. You played in, I think, the greatest football team that I've ever seen <clears throat> for about three or four years. Was Messi quite obviously just the most important player in that team, or is there something that you're going to tell us that's going to surprise me? No, no, Messi, by far, it was the, the difference, was the most important player of the team. I always say that you need a Messi to win titles, but you also need the team. I mean, one thing with the other, it's very difficult, you know? I mean, right now, football is not like in the 80s that one player can win titles. You need a team behind that can defend, that can generate uh, chances, that not just Messi has to score, all the other players, they have yeah. to score goals. And I think that at that time we created that. This is why, for a lot of people, they consider us one of the best teams or the best team that it happened in the history of, of football. But Messi was key. Uh, he had a key role at the end of the day. We are talking for me, the best uh, player in the, the history of the game. And for a long period, because you can talk about Maradona that I didn't see him play in life or, or Pelé that the same but for 15 years to playing at that level that's the, the difference uh, that's yeah. why it's, it's so unique do you cry inside that he's left and he's playing in Paris yeah because <laughs> of us and because of him I think that for the career he had at Barcelona it would be great uh, if he would have stayed uh, until the end but I, I understand, I mean, I can understand what, what happened, no? I mean, the club suffering a lot economically uh, because of the past president, etc., and, and how they manage the club. And, and him at the same time, that he, first he wanted to leave the, the year before, then he wanted to stay, but at the end of the day, it's, it's part of life. Sometimes I, it's similar to what happened to me when I was 17, how I can leave Barcelona. Uh, yeah. Because sometimes there are situations that, that you make a decision or you make a move, and I assume that now he, he's playing for Paris, that is another great club, and he will have chances to, to win titles. In fact, he will win the, league, the French League. Yeah. But for Barcelona and for the fan here that Messi is, I mean, is, is like God, uh, it would be great if he would have a state. In terms of the European Super League, Barcelona are still part of the group. How is it viewed here in Spain? In my opinion, I think that you destroy football. But with this opinion, I'm going against my club on this. No, and I You're the future I, president, though. No, 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 no. <laughs>
pay cut to be able to stay at the club so the club can afford to pay you. What's the current state of the club? I think it's, I read that it was £1.2 billion pounds in debt. That's a severe situation for such a great club. This is what happens when you manage the club poorly, when there is COVID impact, it's, it's huge for the clubs, but also for Barcelona. And I think that Barcelona, because it's a big club and have the opportunity to generate a lot of revenues, will be able to, to return that debt and, and be great and big again and have a great team. But you need time. You need time and you need effort from everyone, sacrifices in order to try to change that dynamic of losing every year more money, more money to start winning and, and trying to recover economically. And obviously when economically you are better, uh, you will see on the pitch that you can invest more money. In terms of in the last 12 months, the European Super League, Barcelona are still part of the group with Real Madrid and Juventus. What did you make of it as players? We were, I was very critical in yeah. the UK of British team, English teams looking to break away. What, how is it viewed here in Spain? This become very political and uh, at this stage. And, and here in Spain, the thing is that media is very controlled by different people that are supporting the Super League. So it's not seen as in UK, where I, I know because I saw in the news that everyone was very against that. Here it's a little bit different. I think that right now everything is very kind of blocked and I don't think it will go nowhere. In my opinion, I think that you destroy football doing, doing this move because it's true that the big ones will benefit out of it, but you destroy the kind of clubs that uh, Sevilla, Valencia, in, in, in England there is, there is a lot of clubs that they have big fan base of supporters that uh, all of a sudden will not disappear the first day, but in five years, ten years, they, they will do it because they will not have any revenues because everything will be focused on that Super League where uh, teams that are not top top will not play. So it's kind of destroying football a little bit. Uh, I can understand the point of view of these big clubs doing that because some of them are owned by owners that all what they want is the club to be valued more. And, but Barcelona is not though, it's owned by exactly. its members. So why, why would Barcelona still be part of it now? I don't understand. I don't think... With you saying that? I, I don't think here in Barcelona or Madrid have explained in the right way what will happen because they try to defend their position, yeah. which is a position of going to the Super League. And I don't think that this is the way to go. But listen, with this opinion, I'm going against my club on this. No, and I don't, the future I, president now. No, 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 no. <laughs> but but uh, it's, it's just my opinion on that. I, I, I totally understand the point of view of the clubs like Barcelona, Madrid or, or Juventus that they still support this idea and all the others that they join at that moment because I remember that there were 12 clubs when they yeah. started so it's for a reason no because there are some numbers and you can see that numbers obviously will be better if they go together and they create uh, another league but for the fan uh, the point of view if you see uh, if you are a fan I don't think it's 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 the way to go in England we see it as Juventus Italian football and Spanish football being very desperate because of the amount of debt yeah. and the fact that you can't get the revenues at the Premier League. Is that, is that the truth? Because of the debt well, over here? Um, and... uh, for sure, Premier League is, is the league that is best managed in, in Europe and in the world uh, and, and that generate more, more revenue. I mean, this is, this is a fact, no? I think that in Spain we're doing things better than in the past. In the 90s, mm -hmm. everything was very bad. Now, now it's much better. And in Italy, I think that is a little bit worse than in Spain. There are a lot of clubs with debts, COVID didn't help. I always say that right now, how football it is, everything works. Uh, you don't have to change something when it's, it's working. You talk about the influence of Spanish football and Spanish football's doing things better. You've set up a company, Cosmos, which has having now a direct influence in sort of the shaping of Spanish football with the Super Cup that yeah. you've organised. You've heard a bit of controversy yeah. where your company has taken a commission for setting up a deal which has actually benefited the league. I'm fascinated that you, the boy I met at 17 in that <laughs> Manchester dressing room, is now got a huge company. You're investing heavily into it. It's absolutely brilliant, by the way. And you're actually starting to shape the game in this country. How has that happened in the last few years? And what well, do you think of the controversy as well? No, I mean, about the controversy this last week has been a nightmare because here in Spain, I mean... Because you're raking... You're, yeah. you're raking. <laughs> when you talk about big amounts of money, people is like in Spain, they don't like it. It's a kind of culture that, well, I mean, it's what it is. But um, 
Uh, I'm very proud of what we did in terms of the Spanish Super Cup, for example. It was a competition that it was an official competition where it was played by the winner of La Liga and the winner of the Cup. And it was just one game. No one cared. No mm. one really cared about that competition. Similar to the Community Shield, but uh, the yeah. Community Shield in England, I mean, the stadium is full and yeah. it's the first game of the season. I mean, it's, it's different here. It was not that kind of feeling. So I proposed the president of the Spanish Federation to change the format, to do it more semi-final, final. So it's a week of competition. You playing for Barcelona, persuaded yeah, 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 yeah. the president of the Federation yeah, to yeah. change his competition. Yeah, because I thought, and I really believe that, and I think it's been proven because right now we played already three years with this uh, format, yeah. that is much better. The, the interest of the whole country when that competition is happening right now is totally different of what it was in the past. So I think it's, it's proven that it, it's a big success. And the other thing that we propose is in, instead of doing it in Spain, that why we don't try to move it to another country which you give the opportunity for other fans that they are not, they don't have the chance to be in Spain and, and yeah. watch games uh, every and, week. And that's the controversy, isn't it? Because it's, it's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, exactly, and what's exactly. your view on Saudi Arabia? You can understand maybe it can't you with obviously I, the... I totally understand the, the point of view of people saying that we don't want to go to Saudi, but first of all, it wasn't my decision. At the end of the day, this is the decision of the Federation. I just proposed, we, we, we had two options. One was this one and the other one was going to the United States, to Miami, to do the same thing. And we put the both proposals to the Spanish Federation and they decided. Uh, it was their decision. But also, I, I totally understand the ones that they're saying, no, Saudi, the government, what they do, human rights, etc. I, I, I totally get it. But I, I always say that uh, football and sports, they open countries. And, and when you go there, there are a lot of people in that country that they have nothing to do of what the government thinks or does, don't think, and you give them the opportunity to enjoy bringing their football, Barcelona versus Madrid this year, for example, that this will never happen if it's not because of the Spanish Super Cup. On the 82, we had the World Cup in Spain, for example. We host the, the World Cup in Spain. And they give us that opportunity in the 66 or 67, they decided to give us that opportunity to Spain. When at that time we had Franco here in Spain, that, dictator, they, yeah. that he was a dictator. So FIFA gave us that opportunity, even though the guy that was governing the, the, the country was a dictator. So, and that World Cup in the 82 gave us the chance to open ourselves to the world. So at the end of the day, I don't think we have to think just about who is, uh, who is the government or, or what they are doing. We have to think about the people that is in that country, that they have no fault, they didn't do anything wrong, and that all we want is to give the chance to those people to, to, to enjoy at least bringing football there. It's been going on for three years. Why is the controversy this week? Why has it come out? Is it because of a, this is, is someone scheming against no, you? This is why it's so, everything is so strange. I mean, on 2019, that news came up and they talked about Cosmos, about the commission, about the new format on 2019. And no one said nothing. Now in 2022, all of a sudden... But what's the problem? Why is it $4 million or $4 million? Euros? What's happening is that uh, there's been audios uh, in WhatsApp being leaked, uh, because I think that the president of the Spanish uh, Federation, Rubiales, someone got access to his phone and got all the information. And there is all the conversations between Rubiales and myself on how we close the deal, etc. And how then, have they got his, how is that? This just happened in Spain. <laughs> and they leak it. Is and, Franco back? No, they leak it and this is illegal and no one cares about that, but they care about the commission and about okay. uh, the Super Cup. It's very strange, okay. but uh, it's how media works here in Spain. You have a good relationship with the media? I have great relationship <laughs> with media. <laughs> Would you ever go into coaching? No, no chance. I saw you and I learned from you, no chance. <laughs> you played, by the way, in yeah, 7-0. I, I, I didn't played even know game. you played. What do you remember of that night? It was a pretty easy game. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it was semi-finals of the cup, playing at Camp Nou, and, and it was a pretty easy game. <laughs> I mean, we didn't expect that result, of course. It was semi-finals against Valencia, but we played very good. At that time, we were very strong at home. And yeah, I remember the second leg, we sent the second team to play. Yeah, we, we, we I drew. drew one, one, I was yeah. <laughs> With all the young kids. Anyway, so the, the question to you is, when was your lowest moment in your life that you remember where you feel like you lost your confidence and you feel like you needed help, you might have gone and spoken to people? I've never been so low. As to, me, to, seven to, No, 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 no. <laughs> to, 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 to be in that position where you need to talk to people and, and, and that you are kind of depression and not at that level, I think that you, in a career you have your picks yeah. and, and to have your, the tools to solve it. The bad moments are obviously difficult to deal with that, with that but I think it makes you uh, stronger and, and better. We've talked about that. I mean, maybe the Bolton moment was a very tough moment that I had to deal at that time. And then in Barcelona, there have been some moments where for different reasons, uh, it was also difficult. I mean, it's impossible in a career of 15, 16 years that you don't have your moments where, where you have to really fight and, and work hard to be in a better position, you know? So I'm sat here with a businessman, someone who employs 100 people. You've set up your own company, Cosmos. You've invested heavily into it. You spend a lot of time there after training. Talk to me about it and how it came about. Well, um, it's something that came natural. Um, I was playing here in Barcelona. I realized that I have some time where I finished training and I had nothing to do. I really wanted to explore the possibility of doing business, but it, it's not about business of, or making money. It's true that at the end of the day, when you enter in this kind of world, you want to make money because it's kind of, you, you are succeeding no? and, and this is what you want. What I really like about this process is about meeting very interesting people that is much smarter than me. Uh, you learn a lot, you travel, you uh, live experiences that you don't live in, in, in the football world. So we started in 2018, now it's more than four years. We started with the Davis Cup, uh, which is the World Cup of Tennis. Uh, we convinced the ITF that it's like FIFA for tennis to make a deal where we pay a fee and in exchange we, we commercialize the whole competition for the next 25 years. And from there, we started to do different things. So we bought a club, a football club, which is Football Club Andorra, in the fifth division of Spain. Right now, we are in the third and we are first. So this year, I hope we can promote to the second division and, and to the professional football. Similar to what you're doing with Salford, that you can explain me later. We also did uh, all this project related to the Spanish Super Cup, uh, not just in football, but we are doing things in tennis. We have a tennis agency. We are doing things with the streamers in Twitch, uh, which this is a new thing for these new generations. But we have an eSports club where we have two teams in the club. We, we do a lot of things, uh, content related to sports. We did a documentary now with Eric Cantona. So we do a lot of things and, and I'm very proud of it because at the end of the day, you have a whole uh, company with a lot of people in the office and, and every day you go there and there is new like stuff. It? And I love it, I love it. I spend a lot of time in the office, really. Is it hard managing people in the office? It's the, the, the hardest, I mean, managing people because uh, everyone has their, their life and everyone has their issues and their problems and you have to kind of talk to them and convince them and motivate them some days and uh, you have to work as a team but at the same time as an individual they have to try to be better and it's a challenge and this is it's, it's very tough. It's, I would say it's, it's the most difficult thing of, of having a company. How do you, as the football player you are, influence the International Tennis Federation to change the whole concept of well, the Davis Cup. Well, I remember when I had the idea because I, I was seeing that Davis Cup was an amazing competition that every year was kind of dying a little yeah. bit because top players were not playing, the, the format was very difficult to follow for, for players, for fans, for everyone. And I, I went to my dad, uh, my dad always has trust in me and everything. I said, if you want to do it, you will do it. And in this case, I said, I want to do this. And he said, don't do it. <laughs> I mean, it's the first time in my <laughs> life that he said, better not to do it because you have no chance. There are big companies there that for sure they, they proposed it before and, and that if they didn't work out. But at least I wanted to try. I had a meeting with the president of the ITF. We had a very good connection. I explained the whole project. Obviously, we had to invest very hard in terms of uh, financing the whole competition, but 
At the end of the day, we went to the whole, to the assembly, more than 200 federations. Uh, it was in Orlando, in the middle of the season. I remember Valverde was the coach and I had to convince him to let me go to Orlando and come back in the middle of the season. We had the game in two days. <laughs> Imagine how difficult it was that. So I went to Orlando, I did a speech. Uh, we needed 66% of the, of the votes of, the, of all the nations and we got 71%. No one at the time trust on us. And we got it. And since there, uh, we, we started this journey, this trip, where, as I say, I, I enjoyed a lot and I'm enjoying a lot. What's the investment into that, just that particular tournament itself? In, in particular tournament, I think, uh, I don't remember now the, the numbers, but uh, we will invest like three billion in the, in the next 25 years in the competition. And that's underwritten by your company? Uh, yeah, yeah, by, by our company. And we started investing the first year more than 30 million. Uh, and uh, this was in 2019. We did it in Madrid. Now in 2022, we are doing it in four different countries, which I think will be amazing. We are doing one of the group stage. It will be in UK, in Scotland. It's tough because um, the wall of tennis is very political, a little bit like football, and, and you have to move, you know, uh, there is a lot of parties, so there is ITF, there is ATP, there is the four grand slams, and, and you have to deal with that, but uh, right now we had a learning process uh, of four years now already, and, and I think that we are more than ready to know who is who and to deal with all of this. You're not messing around, are you? Well, I mean, with the investment that we put on the table, I can tell you that uh, I cannot mess around, I tell you. No, no, we are very focused and, and we really like it. Yeah. I mean, it's not about money, it's because we, we really feel that we want to do it. What's your plan with the football club, Andorra? When I arrived in Andorra uh, on 2019, I think it was, uh, I said that it was in fifth division, I said that I wanted the the anthem of the Champions League yeah, to be no. sound in, in Andorra. So, <laughs> I mean, step by step, we are going there. It's, it's a process, but now, as I say, we are first in, in the third division. I hope we can promote this year. That would be an amazing news. I, I really believe, I mean, I know it's, it's a, a huge uh, objective to, be, yeah. to, to play the Championship with Andorra. And now it's, uh, everyone that will listen to this interview will say this guy is crazy, but but uh, I like to have very big objectives. If not, it doesn't make any sense. And what's the idea behind it? What's the, just to do something with a football club to grow your football knowledge and, and ownership knowledge? So at the end of the day, one of, my, why, one of my ideas that some days I want to do it, some days I don't want to do it. It depends on the day. I, I, I always had the, the, the idea to be the president of Barcelona. This experience with Andorra has helped me a lot to understand how to manage a club, it's true that you cannot compare both clubs because it doesn't make any sense. But starting a project like this, that it's a very small club and how little by little it's, it's growing, it's, it's a great experience. So in terms of just at this moment in time, your post-football career, how long do you think you'll play for? Have you got, will you go next season again? Yeah, next, I'm, I'm going year per year now. I, I, don't, I don't want to say I will retire this year. But uh, you definitely will go next, you definitely play yeah, next yeah, season? Yeah. yeah. You feel good still? Yeah, yeah, I feel very good. I had a very good season this year, personally. I feel very, very good. And it's exciting what, what we have ahead of us in terms of the young kids that are coming from La Masia. They have a lot of level, a lot of talent. And, and, and I think that with Xavi, that he has brought uh, a new way of, of doing things, I think we, we have a chance next year to win titles again. And is your path post-football to be grow the business and eventually one day everyone thinks that you are going to become the president of Barcelona. Is that the, is that the sort of end for you? I don't know. I don't like to, I don't Come like to on. have, no, no, really, really, Gary, there's been times where I said, yeah, I want to do it. And for example, the last elections, uh, I was trying to see what, what uh, I do in this case, in that case. Uh, Did you think of going early and going then? Could you have gone then? No. I like to do things when I feel it. Uh, and if it's young, I don't care about the age. If, if I retire and in two years there is elections and I feel that you could uh, go. I, I could go. I need to feel that I'm ready, which this is why all this process with Andorra, etc. Plus I know the club very well. So it depends on how I feel personally at that time. I really want to help the club uh, to, to, to be very successful. Would you ever go into coaching? No, no chance. 
no chance. It's it's two sacrifices, <laughs> daily basis, uh, managing 25 guys that they want to play, that you have to manage 13 or 14 that they will not play, and egos and no f them, no chance, no chance, <laughs> no chance. I wish I'd said f them I, before I, I did it. I saw you and I learned from you, no chance. <laughs> Oh, I helped you somewhere along the way. <laughs> and finally, if you could say what was the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? Be yourself. Um, and no one told me. I learned <laughs> in the way. I mean, you have to be yourself. You don't have to care about what people think or what people say about you. You have to enjoy life. Life is very short and you have to live the moment. And is what I tried to do in the last few years. Uh, sometimes even my parents, because they are worried, sometimes they say, Jera, you have to try to say something because they are expecting this, you to say this. So you have to say this. And no, I will say whatever I think or whatever my opinion is, because it's what it is. Sometimes because of the pressure of the context and, and society, we want to, to be alike. We want people to like you. And, and it's not about this, it's about being yourself and being happy about what who you are so be yourself brilliant i love that thank you <laughs> thank you